Uh, we're going to talk about a really cool topic today. We're going to talk about how do you interact with all those connected devices and does it matter? Does it really matter at the end of the day? How do we create value from that? How do we move forward from that? One of the things I always like to do is to get a good sense of how connected this room is. So don't be bashful. We'll see if we can get a, a, a room record here. How many of you have at least two connected devices on you right now? Have at least two. Okay. How many of you have three? Oh, okay. Four. Oh, anybody got four? Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Five. I like you, man. I like you. We, we move together. <laughs> five. Nobody has five? Okay. The most we've ever had is seven. The most we've ever had seven. And it was funny. He was a Cisco engineer. He did have a router in his backpack, but, but he did have seven connected devices. In fact, I just picked up a really new connected device. Have you ever seen these, uh, the Bose uh, sunshades, sunglasses? Oh, man, but they're connected. Isn't that, isn't that great? So um, I'm married. My, wife, my wife's back there. She didn't like them, though. She doesn't like them because when she's having a conversation with me, she can't tell if I'm listening to Spike Ferrison's, that, that nice podcast about cars, or I'm really paying attention. So husband's in the room. Get your pair. Get your pair. Get your pair. Okay, so let's get started, right? Let, let's, let's uh, first off, um, I want you to introduce you to somebody who's really important uh, in my life. So this is my dad. That's my dad, right? And uh, my hero, uh, incredible guy. And my mom is great, too. She'll be watching this. So yes, mom, I love you, too. Um, but my dad, I got to tell you a special story. So he is so into cars. I mean, he is a car guy. Right, so that's the Chicago uh, Auto Show, and he was so excited about the new cars. Things are going on, so we get home, and it's probably you get back into California. It's probably close to ten or eleven o'clock, right? And he's so excited about this new Cadillac. He gets online now. It's eleven midnight, and he calls and he gets on his phone. And he goes, "Oh, oh, let me see if I can reach the dealership." So he starts chatting, and he tells the dealership, "Hey, man, I just saw this car and great." And the dealership, Mike. Mike says, how can I help you? My dad says, oh, I want to know about the features of this car. And Mike says, oh, great. Let me tell you about the features. And my dad is like, wow, isn't this cool? He goes, Joseph, it's 11 o'clock, man, and they are giving me this personalized attention. They knew that the show was still going on, so I'm sure that they were able to work and stay afterwards because, you know, people are going to be asking questions. You think that what was happening? Do you think he was talking to Mike as a human? Now, you ask my dad, he swears up and down, Mike is human. <laughs> Mike is my guy. He's a person, man. What are you talking about? I said, Dad, I don't think Mike is human. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm, I'm trying, I don't know how to put it to you, but it, basically, it looks like a bunch of code, maybe. You know, let me go to the web page. Let me show you the code behind it. It sort of looks like that. He goes, no. I said, why don't you ask Mike? Ask him, are you human? Are you human, Mike? So he did. What do you think happened? Silence. Silence. Right? Nothing happened. I said, Mike, are you human? It was like a long pause. Long pause, probably searching, oh, oh I'll answer this question. Right? And my dad said, oh my God. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Then he said, nah, to this day, Mike's still his best friend. <laughs> right? But when you think about what's happening, more of us are going to have more conversation with bots than we, have, we will have with our spouses by 2023. You in this room, what are you going to do after school? What are you going to try to get? Your parents hope you're going to try to get. What are you going to try to get? A job. Who's going to decide whether you get a job or not? Ooh. Uh-oh. Don't you want to know that? Don't, don't you want to know the answer to that question? Is that important to you? Yeah, yeah, right? 50% of these jobs, 50% of the selection process early on in the beginning, right, is some type of algorithm or AI is going to be used. So it matters. It's really, really, really important, right? It's really, really important. So when you think about, oh, when, when you think about ultimately how you create value in this world, artificial intelligence is great. Intelligence is great. It's 50% of the equation that's required for you to be successful in the business world. What's the other part? EQ. Emotional capabilities, right? 
So while we have artificial intelligence, there's a need to go beyond AI and move to something I call digital humanism, right? It's the ability to understand that we want to enhance the human spirit by figuring out how we can connect to things in a different way. But the point is, humans are at the center. It's really, really important. Humans are at the center, right? So whether we're talking about connecting you to things and IoT, or whether we're talking about data science and structured data analytics, or whether we're talking about how we fundamentally change the process, the power and the value of the digital age is how can you extract that and make it real to us as humans? How do we enhance our ability to execute? So let me give you a real life example. Okay, so I was working one of my first consulting projects. I took over our Internet of Things and this retailer came to me and said about 10 years ago, said, Joseph, we need your help. We're really confused. I'm a consultant, so I get really excited when I hear those words. Help and confused, that's a good thing, right? They said, when our lines get long in the store, people leave. They abandon the lines. So how do we figure out how do we reduce the amount of time a customer waits in line? Because when customers see lines are long, they leave, right? Everybody got that? Pretty simple. Okay, so the first thing we did is we said, tell me a thing. Tell me something that's not connected that could be connected to help us improve that product, help us answer that question. So you imagine you're in your car, you pull into a parking lot. Ooh, that's not connected. It's something that's an asset. So we can connect that parking lot. The next thing is you grab what? A shopping cart. Okay, so we can connect the shopping cart. So those are our things. Then we go, well, what data can we extract from that? Okay, so the parking lot gives us one or zero. You're either there or you're not there, right? What about the shopping cart? Now we got geospatial information, right? So we know where you are in the store. Then we got the process. Ah, that means we can apply analytics to change how we do work. So in other words, we can tell 40 minutes in advance when a particular line is gonna get long based on a number of people going into the store and where they are in the store. Awesome, we got it. Have I mentioned people yet? Did I mention people yet? Mm. Mm. We said we got it. We absolutely have it. Remember our, remember our question was, when people perceive lines are getting long, they do what? They leave, right? All right, so we all we got 40 minutes in advance, so here's what happens. They go, Joseph, great solution. We're not done yet. No, 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 great solution. We got it, we're gonna put it in store. Okay, put the solution in. The guy grabs the microphone and says, all right, Oh, hey, Mark, manager gets all excited. Hey, Mark, our lines are getting long. I need you to come back from stand, check stand four, come up, come up from the back, back of the store. I need you to come up and open up check stand number four, Mark. Our lines are getting long. Mark, check stand number four. You guys ever heard that in the store? What did he just do? What did he do? What was our problem? When customers perceive lines are getting long, they do what? They want to leave. He grabbed the mic, and what did he tell every customer in the store? He told every customer in the store that the lines are going to get long. All that valuable technology just did what? Oh, man, I know Mark. He ain't coming. I'm out of here, dude. Everybody left. Everybody left. We didn't connect it to people, right? We didn't connect it to people. That's the power and importance of connecting the solution ultimately to people. Okay. So... When you think about digital humanism, there's three things that, especially you students in this environment, you should keep on your mind. There's three, what I would call, key implications. The first one, how many have heard real about real time? Real time, real time, real time. Let me tell you something, man. Uh-uh. Real time is way too late. You see that car right there? My daughter is Renelle. Renelle Bradley is a very smart young lady. Um, she went through a period of time when she was a teenager and she lost her smarts, but then she got it back <laughs> again. But while she was going through this time as a teenager, that is her car, actual PT Cruiser. And as she explained to me, Dad, I've been on this planet 16 years. I know how to drive. Okay. You might want to check the oil before you go on the freeway. No, you got it. Okay. Okay. You got it. 16 years old. You got it. On the freeway, in real time, what happens? 
that little light right there comes on. Boom, in real time. What happens three seconds later? The old dad's got to buy a brand new engine. <laughs> Boom. Did real time matter? No. Real time is too late. So you got to be thinking about that. Real time is way too late. And why is it too late? It's too late because knowing what you are going to do now is more valuable than what you actually do. How do you test that? Well, let's think of it this way. We got one person up there who's going to buy a car, right? One person is going to buy a car. I'm a dealership. In fact, this whole room is a dealership. All you guys dealership. And this one person, he's going to buy a car. Guess what? You, all of you, have got to pay me to know that he's going to buy a car. All of y'all got to do that. Every single one of you. You need it. You got to know. You're information junkies, right? You got to know where to direct your stuff. He's going to buy a car. How many cars are you going to buy? One. How many of there's you in the room? All oh, y'all going to pay for me. Ford, GM, all of them, right? That's the power of knowing what you're going to do. That's why predictability is so, so very valuable, right? So very valuable. All right, second thing is context. We talk about the Internet of Things. Why do we talk about the Internet of Things? What does it do for you? Why do we care? What is, what is connecting all this stuff? Why does it matter? Okay. As you get in your business careers, you will soon see that many of you will begin to travel. Right? How many of you have traveled internationally yet? Has anybody traveled internationally? Oh, that's great. That's outstanding. That's, that's really good. So I travel about 375,000 miles a year. Right? I've basically been to every major continent. I go there every year, pretty much. I have a team that's global, right? And so here's what happens. I'm getting ready to finally get on a plane. I happen to be global services. They treat me a little bit special. So I get, you know, get to get to the side. I'm getting that long line. I feel good about that. That's great. That makes me feel special. And then I go, oh, oh, sh oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, no, oh, man. I don't have my Bose noise-canceling headphones. And that, my friends, is a major, major problem. Now, why is that a problem? Those of you, as you travel more, you will soon see this beautiful young couple. Beautiful. 35, 37, with two well-behaved kids. Two <laughs> and four. Well-behaved. Until they come across the line and they scan that ticket. And it goes, Doop! and they go, oh, where is Joseph Bradley? Where is he? Where is he? Doesn't matter if he's in front row, back row, middle row. I can't wait to sit next to him. Woo! Right? Whole flight, I want to just show him all the joy of him. Back of that seat. Now, Joseph Bradley, African-American male, millennial, as we've already discussed, <laughs> looking for a pair of headphones is very different than Joseph Bradley, African-American male, millennial, looking for a pair of headphones on the weekend with my son. Two completely different people. How do you know? Context. In the first case, you've seen those, uh, those nice like uh, Best Buy or those kiosks that got all the stuff in it that you need. I'm going to that thing, that's my wife. I got about five camp boys, nose boys and cancer ham phones. I got five bows, easy. Why? Because I'm going there when I forget, I'm buying one and I'm buying two just to make sure they don't run out. I got an eight hour flight, I don't care. I just want it now, I need to have it right then. Now you go to the other side. Now you go on a weekend, uh oh. Well, my wife loves to shop, I'm not a little shopper. So I want to spend as much time as I can in that store. So I'm talking to that person and I want to be intellectually stimulated, right? Two completely different individuals. How do you know? Context. That's why connecting things is so valuably important. So we now can predict about 93% of human behavior just from your phone. Just from your phone. We ain't brought in all the other good social media stuff. I love you guys. I love Who are all you social media people? Woo! Love you. <laughs> love you. Uh-oh, whoa, look at that, man. This is a different room. Look at that, man. Where's my privacy people? Where's my privacy people? You, 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 nobody concerned about that? You okay with that? 93% of your human behavior, man, based on the apps you got, proximity, where you, we know what's going on. Hmm. How many people worried about privacy? 
that's interesting. It's about split. How many people don't, man, that's all good. Privacy is all good. How many people? Wow, that's very interesting. Okay, so those people who raise your hand, who cares about their privacy? All right, okay, good. So let me ask you a question. The people that raise their hand, you go to a grocery store, right? But you told me you value your privacy, right? Well, why do you go to a grocery store and you put everything you're going to buy on that conveyor belt so everybody can see? It's just the way it is out there. The way it is. He sees value from it, right? It's okay. It's not bad. But you go to restaurants, right? Pay with your credit card or some car. Cash. cash. You use cash. Who pays their credit card? Okay. Pay with your credit card. You give your credit card to somebody you don't know. They go around the bin. You don't know what they do. They come back and they give you a single piece of paper and you more than happy to sign it. Some of you don't even look to see if it's your bill. But you value your privacy. Why is that? Because privacy is contextually based, right? It's based on the value you receive, right? That's why it's so hard to implement policy around it. It's going to be a great discussion. Okay, last thing I want to tell you about is insight is a currency of the 21st century. Insight. Everybody's trying to find insight. So how many people talk, heard about security? In the internet of things. Everybody's talking about security, how to make sure things are secure. Especially talking about data. We want to make sure it's safe and secure, right? Why do you care if your data is safe and secure? Because you assume that data is valuable. Why is data valuable? Because you assume it is. What's up, man? I see you there. How you doing? That's my son's roommate. I didn't see him, man. Right? That was awesome, man. That was good to see you, man. Um, we got to talk about JoJo, man. He ain't, we got to talk about him. Uh, that's great. But why do you assume? Because data is assumed to be correct. That's why you use data is valuable, because you assume it to be correct. By 2020, all of you in this room, here's some bad news. 60% of the information you consume will be false. Uh-oh. 60% of the information you consume will be false. Uh-oh. So let's test this out. All right. Look at this picture. Show of hands. <laughs> How many people say this is real or fake? Okay. Real, raise your hands. Fake, raise your hands. Fake's got it. Real or fake? Real, raise your hands. Fake, raise your hands. Fake's got it. Real or fake? Real? Fake? Ah, come on, y'all. This is real. This is real. Now, you know that's not me in the picture. Because <laughs> if it would have been me, the picture would have been blurred. Because I would have been moving so fast, the paddles, I guarantee you, would never been in focus, right? Look at the size of that thing. Okay, last one. Real or fake? Real? Fake? Oh, sure. Fake. Fake, yeah. Real. Poor judgment, poor judgment, lady with a kid, poor judgment. Okay, <laughs> poor judgment. I mean, yeah, yeah, you all these sharks, you got poor judgment. I give you that, right? I give you that, right? I give you that. Okay. How many people say, look at all these pictures. How many people say 25% roughly of those pictures are real? How about 25%? Okay. How many people say 50%, about half of those pictures are real? They're actual real photo of something. Somebody took a picture, and it's, the thing you're looking at is actually a real, it, it exists. It exists. Okay? How many people say 75% are real? Okay. None of those are real photos. Not one of those. Not one of those is it. Those are all AI generated. Not one of those is real. Not one. Oh, that messes you up now. Y'all messed up now, huh? <laughs> You're all messed up now. Look at you all. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Right? Now, one photo is real, right? So the point that I'm going to talk to you about is data integrity really matters. That's what you should get out of this section, right? Data integrity matters. You need to make sure you understand what is real, what is not real, and ask questions, right? So whether you are Christopher Columbus messed up from Roman Miles, Use Roman instead of Arabic miles, or NASA Mars, or whatever, my favorite one. My Lord, a contractor used the English system instead of the metric system. We lost the dang orbiter. We're going to talk about that a lot. $3 trillion worth of bad data, right? $3 trillion. $3 trillion a year because of bad data, right? Data integrity 
truly, truly matters. So what are we doing about data integrity? That's where all this trust technologies come up. Now, I'm not going to give you a blockchain lecture or things around distributed ledger technologies, but the point is that I want, that I want you to understand is, is you need to be clear around how you will judge and how you will ask about the integrity of data. So let me put it to you this way. It is okay by definition to be lost. If you're a student, it's okay to be lost. What do I mean by that? That means that you don't necessarily know how to get to where you're going, but you know where you're trying to be. You know where you're trying to go. So that means you, you, your path might look like this. It might change, but that's okay. That's natural, right? That's all right. It is not okay in a world where 60% of the data you consume is going to be false for you just to be wandering around. That's not okay. Why is that? You won't allow them to tell you where you want to go and where you should think, where you should be? No, 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 right? Doesn't matter where you choose. You can choose, change your destination point, but you want to make sure that who are the top three people that you are listening to each and every day, right? What field are you currently interested in? Be active and proactive in that journey. Don't let others just kind of feed you information. Choose. Doesn't matter if your choice is right, doesn't matter if your choice is wrong. You're going, to just, you're going to take a bunch of waypoints, but you want to be clear, you want to control, you want to understand, you want to question, because if you don't, man, that's not a good place to be in, right? So when you think about this world that I just described, real time too late, context is king. We're connecting all this great stuff, right? And insight is so critically important. It requires a different model of leadership that you are going to be coming into. It's a different model of leadership. Einstein said if he had one minute to save the world, he'd think about it for 60, 60 seconds, or 50 seconds, sorry, and implement it the last 10. Why is that? It's because the fundamental questions that you ask shape where your target is. Have you ever played any kind of sport? Whether it's, I coached basketball for many years, right? We all talk about body position aligning yourself, squaring up to the basket, whether you're talking about golf, you play it, football, doesn't matter, body position is everything. If the goal is to the right and you line up to the left, it's hard to make that shot. It's really hard. Same thing happens. If you're fundamentally asking the wrong question, it is really, really difficult to get there. In a world where all the answers are known, that's the world you about to be born into. When you come into the business world, man, you about to come in with data and analysts everywhere. Value is understanding what question to ask. Now this next slide, don't get me in trouble. I'm counting on you, right? You, you don't, get, don't let me get me in trouble. Do not say Joseph is not supportive of STEM. I am, I love STEM, STEM is awesome. But I got a daughter who's getting her PhD in English, <laughs> right? And you can imagine, I'm at Cisco, what do you think my peers said? <laughs> what do you think they said? PhD at NYU, imagine. Now, I know y'all are USD something, but you, when you start paying for things, you know, those of you who are paying for this education, you will understand. PhD in English, NYU. Now, I'm not telling you she got a full ride scholarship, so that's cool, but, but what do you think they said? What do you think? What is she going to do with that? What the hell are you going to do with that? All that money, what's wrong with you, Joe? Man, what's wrong with you? And my son was the same way. Yeah, right? I'm computer science and economics, man. I got to be STEM. That's what my son is, right? USD is here, right? That's where he's at. He's on that side of the equation. Okay, so let me tell you a story. So remember that story I talked to you about? About the retail mm -hmm. store? Remember that? And we connected that device, but we didn't think about people, right? So I'm telling that story to my son and my daughter. My son says, Jojo says, hey, Ronell, see, this is where money is. You got to be thinking about technology. You got to be thinking about coding. It was about 10 years ago. And you know what my daughter said? She said, Dad, that's a cool story. But I think you asked the wrong question. Uh-oh. I'm, like, um, I'm kind of paying for you a little bit. I think I know a little bit about it. It's a little bit. She said, no, nah, you asked the wrong question. It's 10 years ago now, maybe more than that, maybe 12 years ago. So what do you mean? 
She said, you shouldn't have asked, how do you reduce the lines? You should have asked, how do you eliminate the lines? That's before Apple stores now. Uh-oh. The questions you ask will fundamentally change and restructure how you think of things. So, rise of the humanities, baby. I'm all for STEM. Remember, you're going to protect me, right? You, you, don't get me wrong. I'm all for STEM. If your kid is born to STEM, it's all for it. I love it. Go for it. If you love it, it's great. But let me tell you something. If you sociology, if you English, you're on the humanities side, right on. Because we need you. We need you. Uber. Was Uber a new tech? Was Uber a new technology? Was Uber a new tech? Did the taxi cabs companies know where their cars were all the time? Yeah, they already knew. Uber asked a different question, though. Uh-oh. Uber fundamentally said, not about how do we make the taxi cabs more effective. Uber, Uber says, how do we change the experience from the user perspective? Tech was already there. The tech wasn't a great innovation. We need these humanities, right? Rise of the humanities. Really, really important. STEM is great if you're born in STEM. But you don't put your head in the sand just because you, you, you're not into that. That's all right. That's OK. We need a lot of that skill set. We need a lot of that talent. OK. So asking Michael, how many of you remember Blockbuster? All right, let's listen to my man James. James, talk to me. We are optimistic. We're just as optimistic about our overall economic situation as we are with Blockbuster because we do see that as we change, we're, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to change, don't worry. We ain't got nothing to worry about. We're going to keep figuring out. Our question that we're going to ask is, how do we get more people to come into our stores? That's the core question that we got to keep asking. Okay, let's listen to my boy George at Borders. I think our business may be a, a, a little less uh, vulnerable uh, to some, a swing like this because of the fact that books and uh, CDs, uh, DVDs still represent a really great entertainment value. We ain't got to worry about it. Books and CDs. We just got to worry about how we sell more books and CDs. That's okay. That's the right question, right? Hmm. Microsoft is a great one. Steve Ballmer. With hindsight, are there things I'd do differently? Of course. Like what? Come on, Charlie. I probably would have started us doing hardware earlier so that really? we could have been yeah. more effective in the phone business. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of like an IQ test. Should Microsoft have a position in the phone business? Yes. Uh, the two most profitable companies. We were the number one most profitable company in our business for a long time. Right. Two guys have passed us, and they both did it by making phones, Apple and Samsung. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't think the software was yeah. the right play there, but yeah. the two most profitable companies now in our business are Apple, Samsung, Microsoft. Right. For years, it was Microsoft and some other guys. Yeah. So, do I wish we had done that sooner? Of course I do. Then why didn't you? When the name of your company is Microsoft yeah. and your formula works... Yeah. Our formula was working. Yeah. We were software guys. Mm. When do you change now? When should you question change? It used to be when things were going wrong. Now when things are going right. It's a very different world you live in. Fundamentally a very, very different world. So what I want to talk to you guys about is when you think about that, that chart when we talk about people, process, data, and things, and people were in the middle. Let me share with you what I think are some of the three most important questions from a digital humanistic perspective, from a people perspective, that you should be asking as we move into the digital age. Let's, let's jump into that right now. So let's talk about context first, right? So we talked about AI, man. AI is so critically important, so important. Three questions. Number one, what decisions are you going to enable or are you going to entrust to AI? You got to actually think through that. What decisions do you want to entrust to AI? Number two, how have you eliminated bias in the data? Uh oh, right? Number three, probably the most important one, I love this one. Where has AI made an incorrect decision and why? So valuably important. You don't need to be a data scientist. You don't need to be a coder. All you got to do is ask the question. Very, very fundamentally important. When you think about Amazon, they just launched this uh, autonomous delivery service in their region, right? It's a real service that they, oops, that they, that they, uh, just, that they just uh, went on ahead and, and, uh, and launched. And this service with uh, Amazon 
when they first launched same-day delivery service. They did it in Atlanta, same-day delivery. It worked beautifully. They were so proud of it. It worked. When I say it worked, that means that they did all the analysis and they were able to deliver same-day service. Only one problem, somebody asked a very unique question. Is it inclusive? I say, what do you mean? Well, oh man, 91% of Caucasian Americans in Atlanta could receive same-day Amazon service. 41% of African Americans in Atlanta could receive same-day service. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Something wrong with that? Mm. Something wrong with that. Yeah, you gotta ask the question, right? You gotta ask the question. So, how do you, what do you think about? Really simple. You don't have to be a coder, but just think about these questions. Number one, think about the word fair. It should be fundamentally sound. That means the data set you're looking at, if I'm looking at a population in this room and I wanna do some voice recognition, I gotta make sure my data set is representative of the world I'm trying to look at. Pretty simple. A accessible. That means no black boxes. Yes, there's neural networks, and by definition, they're cloudy and unfair, but we can't accept that. No black boxes. You gotta understand what's going on. You gotta be able to explain why and what's something happened. Inclusive. That means you gotta make sure that we're not purposely excluding a group based on race, religion, color, ethnicity, anyway, right? We gotta make sure we're not included. And the final one, reversible. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Put yourself as a end user of that AI program. And how would you feel? Simple as that, right? Keep it fair, right? You don't need to be a programmer and ask those questions. You don't need to be technical and ask those questions. Just ask the question. Think about fundamentally sound, accessible, inclusive, reversible. Okay, trust. Trust. How do you establish trust in a world of man and machines, right? How do you do that? Well, the Toronto Declaration, this is a great example. Uh, MC International wrote this, some others. This is all about how do you ensure that you don't allow inequality and discrimination to happen in machine learning, code it. So, is this important? Let's put you this way. Um, in the US, we decided as people that it wasn't important for us to listen to 52% of the workforce. We said, eh, their ideas don't matter. Hashtag me too, right? That's what we said. Let's be clear. That's what we said. We said, you don't matter, we said, you don't matter, we said, you don't matter, you don't matter, you don't matter. We said, we, you don't matter, we said, we don't need to listen to you. We got all the answers. Hmm. All of a sudden, all those great inventions, we don't know how great they could be, do we? Right? It matters. So if it's hard, when people are doing decisions, it's hard. We know it's wrong, but it's hard. How hard is it going to be when it's buried in two million lines of code? You got to get on it now. You gotta ask the question now. This is the time, right? Transparency is, is really, really critical. Why is it so important? Okay, this is really basic. Machines can be responsible, but they cannot be accountable. Let me put it really basic. They can't go to jail, y'all. They ain't going to jail. Who's going to jail? We are humans, right? We gotta be accountable, that's why it's so important. So you think about biases, right? Stereotyping, you know what that is. Priming is, you know, I'm gonna give you, the, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna change the way in which I'm gonna stock the deck. I'm gonna prime you, I'm gonna give you some things you're gonna see first that I'm gonna predict what you're gonna do next, right? I'm gonna reshape what you're doing next, right? And then observational selection, right? My favorite. Hmm, observational selection, oh doing the same thing and expecting different results. <laughs> Definition of insanity. We do this all the time. Observational selection. Let me, let me give you a real live example. In the business world, we say, we want innovation. I want something new. Who am I gonna hire? I want somebody to be in this department for the last 20 years. I want them to be in the same seat for the last 20 years. And I want them to know them for the last 20 years, but I want innovation. Right? Okay, 
bias is really, really clearly important. So, gender bias, words matter. Textio is a great site. If you don't use it, you should probably check it out. Textio is an incredible site. It's, it's the best use of AI I've seen. And what it does is help you eliminate bias in job descriptions. It matters. Dominant, male and female. A lot of men were writing job descriptions and they're inherently biased. So let me give you a great example. It's a real live example. So here's what I did. This was a, uh, our typical way, I was trying to improve diverse applicants. I was trying to improve diverse applicants, right? And we do this all the while, striving for a culture that empowers every person to be different and work in our communities. Oh, right? Equal employer, equal employment opportunity. Hopefully that gets it, right? You've seen all those. We don't discriminate. Race, religion, blah, 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 blah. All right, let me tell you what Textio did with that statement. I love this. They said, colorful hair, don't care. Tattoos, show off your ink. Like polka dots, that's cool. Pop culture geek, many of us are. Be you with us. Woo! Look at it. he's like, yeah, I want to go there. Look, at it. you see? He starts saying, yeah. That's exactly what happened, too. I got like a 2,000% increase in applicants. It's amazing, right? Words matter, right? Words, words matter. Five things I want you to do to fight off bias. Be committed to diverse candidates. Start with the diverse candidates that words matter. Take the names off the resumes. Take them off. Take the names off the resumes. It's a fact. Women are gonna get less jobs than men. Mark will get more jobs than Laquisha. It is a fact. Don't get mad at me. That's just reality. Give people a place to hide their biases so it can come out. Give them a likability score. It's okay. I really like this person. It's gonna come out anyway. So Give it a spot for your bias to come out. Let it come out, right? And what measure, what could measure gets done? So what happens if a diverse world becomes an inclusive one? I know I'm a little bit on time, but I'll be all right. Okay, what's the difference between diversity and inclusion? We use them all the time, diversity and inclusion. Diversity is the ability, the potential to create value. You have a diverse room, but if ain't nobody talking, if we're not connecting, no value is created. Inclusion is the realization of that value by driving full participation. Very, very important. So, inclusion and diversity together is a very, very powerful thing. Inclusion and diversity together is a very, very powerful thing. Very, very powerful thing. Incredible thing we get it right. Incredible thing we get it right. Why does it matter? Why do you care? Man, Donna Strickland, woo! Nobel Prize, I see a lot of you don't have glasses on. You better be thinking Donna, Lasix baby, right? Incredible woman, right? Incredible, incredible. And my man, what the supercomputer? Philip, right? Created the first supercomputer. This stuff matters, this stuff is real. Imagine this, man. Roberto, no wireless telephone, or we'd all be in trouble. You guys would actually have to talk to one another. Can you imagine that? Yeah, that'd be horrible. Imagine that? That'd be horrible, right? Lewis Latimer, light, the filament, unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. One of my favorites, Catherine, how we went to space. This stuff matters, folks. This stuff is really, really, really fundamentally important. And why? It's not because of the corporate visions. People always talk about corporate visions. Corporate visions, is that what you're here for? Yes, do we have to make money in Cisco? Of course we do. Do you have to breathe as a human? Of course you do. But that's not your purpose. Breathing is not your purpose. Making money is not my purpose, right? What is your purpose? Our purpose is to solve some of the world's greatest challenges. We, you, all of us have the opportunity to do so today. One quarter of all humans live without electricity. We got more people with cell phones than assets to a decent bathroom. Can you imagine that? 40 million people thought we got rid of slavery? Nope. 40 million people. This is why it matters. Most importantly, one that's probably most closest and definitely dear to my heart. It's amazing to me. 22,000 children die each day because of poverty. 22,000 faces, 22,000. That is why we are here. 
to solve and address some of these world's difficult challenges. So when you think about digital humanism, and you leave this auditorium today, don't worry about what you don't know. Don't worry about the unknown. But what I want you to do is wake up each and every day and challenge fundamentally what you and you and you believe to be true. Thank you guys, really appreciate it. Thank you very much.